Ski Strong. This is VOA One. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, we have a higher education story about free speech on college campuses. A group of universities is working together on a project that aims to help students learn how to be better citizens. Then, Ana Mateo brings us words and their stories. She looks at English phrases that have to do with the word nest. We close the program with Kelly Jean Kelly and the next part in our series on America's presidents. But first, this question about tennis balls. The sport of tennis has a problem with waste that many players do not even recognize each time they open a new container of game balls. The balls are not recyclable. Almost all of the 330 million balls manufactured each year end up in waste, or garbage, landfills. Once there, it can take as long as 400 years for the balls to decompose. Major professional tennis competitions go through nearly 100,000 balls during two weeks of play. The problem of tennis ball waste has sent ball makers, tennis officials, and recycling companies looking for solutions. Nicholas J. Temelis is director of Columbia University's Earth Engineering Center. Tennis balls, like a lot of objects, are made to be indestructible which means they're very resistant to mechanical processing, he said. But do you take a useful object that lasts forever and say people shouldn't use it because it lasts forever? That's nonsense, he added. Temelis and other experts note that tennis balls make up a tiny percentage of the hundreds of millions of metric tons of garbage produced every year. He says part of the solution is finding ways to do other things with the balls. Anyone who would say you shouldn't play tennis because of the tennis balls is misinformed, said Jason Quinn, director of Colorado State University's Sustainability Research Laboratory. He added, There are things you can do to reuse and repurpose tennis balls to lessen the impact. The International Tennis Federation, or ITF, is a governing body of professional tennis. Last year, the ITF brought together manufacturers, tennis officials, and recyclers to begin working on the tennis ball issue. The group is working to find answers to questions such as, is there a way to design a fully recyclable ball? Can the ITF change rules so balls are used longer in play? Currently, professional players change to a new set of balls after the first seven games and then after every nine games. Manufacturers and recyclers have begun taking steps to reduce and reuse balls. Wilson Sporting Goods introduced its Trinity Ball that keeps air inside the core longer and has a stronger felt. Vermont-based Recycle Balls says it expects to collect 3 million tennis balls this year 
from across the U.S. and Canada. We believe in multiple lives for tennis balls, said Recycle Balls leader Aaron Cunningham. But the group does not want the used balls to stay forever in their storage center. I'm Andrew Smith. And I'm Gina Bennett. Thirteen American colleges and universities recently announced the creation of a plan to support freedom of speech. The plan is part of an effort designed to fight what the schools call threats to U.S. democracy. Among the schools taking part are Cornell University in New York State, Rutgers University in New Jersey, Notre Dame, the Catholic University in the Midwestern state of Indiana, and Benedict College, a historically black school in South Carolina. The effort is called the Campus Call for Free Expression. The organizer of the group is the Institute for Citizens and Scholars, based in Princeton, New Jersey. It is paid for by the Knight Foundation, a private group based in Miami, Florida. The aim is to build respect for freedom of expression in colleges. Another goal is to help students bring opposing groups together. The effort for free speech comes after students at several schools blocked people invited to speak in recent years. The students said they disagreed with the writings, comments, ideas, or actions of the invited speaker. Jonathan Alger is the president of James Madison University in Virginia, one of the schools in the group. He said the group is concerned about deep polarization in the U.S., where people cannot discuss their different ideas in constructive and civil ways. The group started preparing for the campus call for free expression in March 2022. The group came up with five principles of free expression. The principles are to be used for new student orientations, educator training, and special campus gatherings called convocations. The principles include developing knowledge that challenges common beliefs and assumptions, reaching decisions based on evidence, understanding one's own values, and gaining respect for others who have different opinions, and learning that free expression has consequences and does not always lead to approval. Jonathan Holloway is the president at Rutgers. He said he saw a growing lack of respect for American institutions, and he wanted to push back against those feelings. In a discussion with the Associated Press, he said he was concerned by seeing the Confederate flag marched through the U.S. Capitol building during the riot on January 6, 2021. Holloway will lead a first-year class at Rutgers this year. The aim is for the class to create a program that will improve civic education. The nonprofit groups who are supporting the presidents say they are concerned that students may not be learning about how to be good citizens while in college. Rajiv Vinakota is president of the Institute for Citizens and Scholars. He wants students to learn how to interact with people who have different opinions and experiences. And he hopes the 13 schools will be able to lead the way for others who will soon join the group. Vinakota questioned if educators can get above issues of free expression to get people to see that higher education can and should 
play a leading part in what he called civic preparedness. The Knight Foundation gave Vinakota's Institute $250,000 to organize discussions among university leaders over the next year and a half. Alberto Ibargan is the head of the Knight Foundation. He said the group is interested in supporting the project because we believe in the free exchange of ideas. We believe in an informed citizenry. Pan America is a nonprofit group that works with colleges and universities on free expression programs. It is not involved in the campus call for free expression. Kristen Shaverdian is the group's free expression and education program senior manager. She said her group tells students about writers and artists around the world who have faced attacks or suffered for their ideas. They understand the ramifications of squashing another's speech, she said. Lucas Morrell is a professor of politics at Washington and Lee University in Virginia, who is not involved in the project. He is the head of a group called the Academic Freedom Alliance. He said more universities should work on programs that permit students to learn by discussing different evidence-based ideas. If we don't do a good job of helping them be careful readers and careful listeners, it stands to reason that, as citizens, they won't be careful listeners and careful expressors of their own thought, he said. And it will be difficult for us to function as a self-governing society. I'm Faith Perlow. And I'm Dan Friedel. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we explore words and expressions in the English language. We give definitions, examples, and notes on usage. Today, we talk about a word from the animal world, a nest. For some animals, especially birds, a nest is a shelter and a place to raise their young. So it should not be surprising that we use the word nest to talk about our homes. A nest can describe a comfortable home. And if you like to nest, you like to make your home comfy and cozy. In fact, a childbirth expert may tell pregnant women to expect strong nesting feelings to develop late in their pregnancy. This common experience is a way a woman's body prepares for the arrival of the new baby. However, feathering your nest is quite a different thing. If you feather your own nest... You are not making your home comfortable by adding feathers. You are making yourself rich, especially in a way that is unfair or dishonest. But let's get back to nesting. An empty nest is a family home where the children have grown up and left. So an empty nester is a parent whose children have grown up and left home. Some parents may feel sad or lost when they become empty nesters. This is called empty nest syndrome. While parents may feel sad, most children are happy to become independent and fly the coop. To fly the coop is a very informal expression. That means the children have left the family home. A coop is a small structure people make for domesticating birds, namely chickens, 
hens, and roosters. We call these shelters either a chicken coop or a hen house. But for some reason, we never say hen coop or chicken house. Online, you might see the expression fly the nest. That might be more of a British English saying. In the States, we often say fly the coop rather than fly the nest to mean children have left home. However, the expression fly the coop has another meaning. If someone flies the coop, they leave suddenly or secretly. For example, we could say a criminal who snuck out of prison flew the coop. And that's all the time we have for this words and their stories. Once you are finished learning all the English you can, you might have to fly the VOA Learning English Coop. Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English broadcast. We just heard Ana Mateo's words and their stories. Ana discussed phrases having to do with the word nest. Ana is here now. Welcome to the broadcast, Ana. Hello, Dan. Thanks for having me. Can you tell me why you considered writing about the word nest this week? Well, it is back to school time in the United States and many other parts of the world. So many students are heading off to college for their first year. That means many parents are becoming empty nesters. Their child has gone off to school and they are at home by themselves. Anna, yes, it is back to school season. Can you think of some positives about being an empty nester? Of course. This is a great example of the word bittersweet. Because there is sadness and joy at the same time. Sadness at your child not being in the home and joy that they are starting an exciting adventure. Also for parents they may have more spare time. That is extra time to do things they like. Maybe it's traveling or finally finishing some home projects. Or maybe turning their child's room into an exercise room. So what are some other nest phrases you thought of while working on this story? There are so many. I talked about several nest expressions, but not all. For example, nest egg. Stirring up trouble can sometimes be called a wasp's nest. And sometimes my hair in the morning is like a rat's nest. Anna, a rat's nest is a good one for sure. I woke up the other day and felt like my hair was a bit out of control. I went out today. I got a haircut. And it looks much better. Well, Anna, thanks for talking with us about all these nest words. You're welcome, Dan. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about Warren Harding. He was the 29th President of the United States. Harding was very different from the 28th president, Woodrow Wilson. Wilson supported change. Harding promised a return to normalcy. Wilson took steps to protect American workers. Harding often worked to protect business owners. Wilson was slow in supporting voting rights for women and in accepting African-American people as equal to whites. Harding supported women's suffrage and civil rights for African-Americans. Yet both men were popular 
during their years in office. Today, however, historians usually think of Wilson as one of America's best presidents, but Harding is remembered as one of the worst. Warren Harding was the eighth president from the state of Ohio. His parents were both doctors. Harding spoke about having a happy childhood, growing up on a farm with his brothers and sisters. Some of his favorite early activities were performing in a band and working on his college newspaper. Later, Harding, along with two friends, bought a newspaper. It became successful for several reasons. Harding was kind to his employees and shared the company's profits with them. He also tried not to publish stories that criticized politicians or politics from any party. Finally, he married a woman who had an excellent head for business. Florence Kling Harding led the newspaper's circulation department. She also helped to direct her husband's political career. In time, Warren Harding became a state senator, a lieutenant governor of Ohio, and then a member of the U.S. Senate. He especially liked being a senator, and many of the other lawmakers liked him. One reason is because Harding rarely took a controversial position on any issue. Instead, he accepted most of the ideas of the Republican Party. He was also good-looking and had an excellent speaking voice. These qualities helped earn him the Republican presidential nomination in 1920. A few months later, he easily won the national election. President Harding took office shortly after World War I ended. He promised to make Americans feel calm again and also improve the nation's prosperity. Two of Harding's goals were to support business and to limit immigration. He succeeded on both issues. His administration reduced taxes for big businesses and wealthy people. It also increased tariffs, taxes on foreign imports. And the Harding administration put in place new rules on immigration. The rules made it easier for immigrants from northern Europe to enter the country, but harder for immigrants from Russia, eastern, and central Europe. Harding also took steps to improve the effectiveness of the federal government. But his administration is remembered mostly for its problems. At the beginning of his term, Harding reportedly told friends that the job of being president was too much for him. He appeared to want to do well, and he worked hard. But he turned over most of the responsibility to his friends in the cabinet. A few were very able but some were dishonest. They abused their positions to gain wealth for themselves and their families. One of the most famous examples of corruption during Harding's administration is known as the Teapot Dome scandal. The name Teapot Dome comes from a rock in the state of Wyoming. The rock looked like a teapot. Scientists correctly believed that oil could be found in the ground underneath it. At the time, the U.S. Navy depended on oil to fuel its ships. 
So the federal government claimed the land in case the Navy needed to use the oil in an emergency. But a cabinet official who was a friend of Harding took control of the land. He gave a private company permission to search for oil on it in exchange for a large amount of money. Some lawmakers became suspicious, so they opened an investigation. In time, lawyers proved the act of corruption. Harding's friend was the first person to be found guilty of a crime while serving as a cabinet official. But President Harding did not live to see his friend go to jail. The investigation was just beginning when Harding took a trip to the West Coast to campaign for his policies. Some say that Harding was also trying to escape the problems in his administration. He reportedly told one reporter that worrying about what his friends were doing kept him awake at nights. During the trip, Harding showed signs of not being in good health. Doctors thought he could have food poisoning or pneumonia. He was taken to a hotel in San Francisco, California. For a day, he appeared to be feeling better. He was sitting up in bed, and then suddenly his body shook and collapsed. He died instantly. Reports at the time differed on the cause of Harding's death. Some even said that his wife poisoned the president to protect him from being punished for the wrongdoing in his administration. But most historians think that he had long suffered from heart failure and was struck by a heart attack. He was 57. Millions of Americans mourned over Warren Harding's death. They stood beside railroad tracks as his body traveled from California back to Washington, D.C. The following year, Florence Harding also died. She and her husband are buried together under a grand memorial in their hometown in Ohio. But in the years after his death, Harding's public image worsened. More corruption scandals in his administration came to light, and some historians have criticized him for not having a clear idea about how he wanted to lead the country. In 1927, a woman published a book saying she had a long but secret relationship with Harding, both before and during his presidency. She also said he was the father of her daughter. Genetic testing has confirmed her claim. More than 30 years after her book was published, a lawyer discovered love letters from Harding to a different woman. They confirmed that he had a long romantic affair with the wife of one of his friends. Harding had also been married at the time. These reports as well as the corruption during his administration, damaged Harding's public image. But he also seemed to know that he would not be remembered as one of the best occupants of the White House. Instead, he tried to be likable and modest. He called himself a man of limited talents who was not fit for the office of president. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's the Learning English broadcast for today. Thank you, Kelly, for that report. And thanks to our VOA colleagues for their work on today's program. Most importantly, thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. 
I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel.